And Sarah Attar has become the first Saudi woman to compete in Olympic track and field, wearing a headscarf and finishing last in her 800-meter heat on Wednesday. Though the 19-year-old did not qualify for the next round, her participation also has already made history. She drew a huge roar of approval from the crowd of about 80,000 as she strode down the home stretch. Her time of 2 minutes 44.95 seconds was well behind the heat winner, but she left her mark on the Linden game. A student at California Pepperdine University with dual Saudi and U.S. citizenship, she is one of the first two Saudi women ever selected for the Olympics. This is Lindsay Van, one of the best female ski jumpers in the world. Look at her go. This is her at the first ever Women's World Ski Jumping Championship last year, soaring 97 and a half meters. And look at that. Look at that. Making a perfect telemark landing. A gold medal performance. One might call that worthy of the Olympics. But Lindsay Van will not be competing in the Olympics this year because she's a she. Um, men have been ski jumping in the Olympics since the first Winter Games in 1924. Women have been trying to get into the games for ski jumping for years. And the best women in the sport say they're only being excluded from Olympic competition because of bias. That case being helped along by guys like this guy, uh, the president of the International Ski Federation, heard here speaking in 2005. Check this out. Don't forget, it's like jumping down from, let's say, about two meters on the ground about a thousand times a year, which seems not to be appropriate for ladies uh, from a medical point of view. Because, you know, lady parts can't handle the jumping the way that man parts can. Yeah. Uh, a group of world-class female ski jumpers last year tried to force their way into the 2010 Olympics via the Canadian court system. They brought a gender discrimination case against the Vancouver Organizing Committee. Even though the British Columbia Supreme Court agreed that the women were victims of discrimination, the court said that it did not have jurisdiction to tell Olympic organizers what to do. And to add insult to injury, last year, Lindsey Van set the all-time distance record for a ski jump on the exact hill that the men will be competing on this weekend in the Olympics. She started from a slightly higher point up the slope than the men do, but ultimately she flew further than any man ever has. And she still doesn't get to compete. Joining us now is former ESPN producer, the executive producer of this show, my friend Bill Wolf. Hi, Bill. Well, it's adjusting my man parts. <laughs> you can't handle the jumping, yeah, I understand. Well, I don't like to fall Should from that get many you a meters. Shorter yeah, chair, if you would can. that be better? Appreciate that. <laughs> all right, first of all, clearing it up, Lindsey Van is not Lindsey Vaughn. No, no, no. A few nights ago, we had Gene Robinson in the A block. And then Gene Robinson in the C block, yes. totally different people, same sort of situation. <laughs> okay, so downhill skier versus yeah. ski jumper. Yes. Let me put you in the uncomfortable position of being the sort of sports and sexism guy. Do, do you understand the IOC's position here? Yes. Okay. Uh, it is that um, in 2006, when they're deciding which events might get let into the Olympics, there were seven sports eligible. Women's ski jumping was one of them. They examined all seven, and they determined that only one, which is called ski cross, which is four skiers go downhill at the same time and, you know, elbow each other and things like that. Ski derby. As ski I derby. Think of it. Yeah. Uh, that was the only sport that qualified. Their main beef with women's ski jumping is that there hasn't, there isn't enough international competition. The world championships that you referred to in the right through were the first ever world championships. So essentially, they say it's not established enough a sport. Why That's don't they the just position. make it gender? Free. Why don't they just let the women compete alongside the men? Well, they could, although, as you noted, when Lindsey Van made her record jump, she started at a higher point on the hill because presumably she has less mass and force right. equals mass times acceleration. So when they leave the hill to become equal to men, given her mass, she needs an advantage in how far she runs down the hill. I mean, they can conceivably do what you're suggesting, make a unisex competition, but they would have to make. Um, you know, arrangements to make it fair, ultimately. I predict they will be in by the next Olympics. I, I, actually, predict I, I predict that as well. Excellent. I love it when people agree with me. Thank no, you, Bill. I always agree. Especially if you ever accuse me of getting anything wrong, I don't want an on-air correction. <laughs> I understand, Senator. Yeah. Thank you. Bill Wolf is a former producer at ESPN, executive producer of this show, and an all-around good guy. The U.S. teams for this summer's London Olympics are taking shape, and if one young contender has her way, her sport may get a new look. Michelle Miller has the story. In a sport dominated by white athletes, 26-year-old fencer Ibtihaj Muhammad stands out. I know that I am different, but once my mask goes on and Bent. the official or referee tells us to fence, then it's game time. And my purpose when I compete is to win. 
If Muhammad qualifies for the U.S. Olympic team, she'll make history, not because of her race or her religion, but what she chooses to wear. Muhammad fences in her hijab, the traditional Muslim head covering, while Muslim athletes from other countries have competed in the Olympics wearing one. Muhammad would be the first American to do so. What does that mean to you? It's hard to believe that it's 2012 and we haven't had, you know, a covering Muslim woman represent the United States. But if I'm, you know, blessed and fortunate enough to qualify, I would feel honored to be in that position. Getting that position will be tough. Muhammad's specialty is the saber, and the Olympic fencing team only has two spots in that category. She spends more than 30 hours a week sharpening her skills. If you stay close, you can find the blade. And no works as a high school coach six days a week to help pay her way. Muhammad's parents see their daughter as a new American role model. Well, the Muslim used to have um, someone to look up to and someone uh, in, in positivity. It's, that's not what they see in our media. You know, they see negative images and that sort of thing. So it's a wonderful thing. I hope that my story reaches not only Muslim youth and not only minority youth, but women to believe that with all the hard work and all the training that anything is possible. Put your thumb. Currently ranked third in the nation, Muhammad has three more tournaments left to qualify for the summer games. Muhammad finds out if she makes the roster in March. Michelle Miller, CBS News, New York. And good luck to her. London 2012 opened in style, but not without controversy. Even before the game started, there was great debate about whether or not female Muslim athletes could or should wear a hijab or headscarf or in the case of some conservative Muslim countries, whether their female athlete should compete at all. This is the young woman who has dominated the headlines, Wajan Shahakani, an inexperienced teenage heavyweight judo athlete from Saudi Arabia. It's the first time the conservative kingdom has sent female athletes to the Olympics. 800-meter runner Sarah Atta is also in London. The Saudi decision was rather forced by the International Olympic Federation. It now insists every country include women in their sporting delegation. It's a purely tokenistic gesture, frankly. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the only country in the world that prevents girls from practicing sports in government schools. They're not even allowed to join sports club, for example, or even attend matches in stadiums. In the case of Wajan Shahkani, a special sports headscarf has now been agreed on, complying with judo safety regulations, the International Judo Federation originally banned headscarves, and the Saudi dress code. Compromises like this must be the way forward. The International Football Federation, FIFA, recently announced it too would be allowing headscarves. Their previous ban led to Iran's female football team being barred from an Olympic qualifying match last year. Here at the London Olympics, the Egyptian female fencing team told us they hoped to inspire their peers. We are all here proud that we are here and we want to encourage all the girls around all the Arab and African countries to come and go and ask their families to go and practice sport. Princess Haya became the first female equestrian to represent Jordan back in the 1990s. She's now a member of the International Olympic Committee and says the hijab debate should not be given center stage. I'm a Muslim woman and I'm you know, proud of my, my, my background and proud of the people I know who wear the hijab and I'm proud as well of, of the way I decide to um, produce myself in, in public and the way I've been brought up to. They're here as athletes, that is the point. But behind these happy Olympic visitor scenes, the hijab sports debate is raging. Take the French, for example. They won't allow any of their athletes to wear a headscarf. They say it's against their secular values. On the other hand, you have some conservative Muslim clerics who are aggressively questioning the morals of the female Saudi athletes just because they're here at London 2012. The Olympics is supposed to be about athlete performances and about winning medals when international sporting events lead to political, religious or cultural clashes, nobody's a winner. Katia Adler, BBC News, at the Olympic Park in London.
Discussions are underway to possibly include women on Saudi Arabia's Olympic team this year. Saudi Arabia is only one of three countries who have never sent women to the Olympics, but that may change this summer in London. Let's get some more analysis on this and bring in Rima Maktabia on our uh, team here in Abu Dhabi. This is extraordinary if it goes through. It seems very late in the cycle because we are knocking on the door of the Olympics this summer. But where is this all coming from? Really, it's quite significant, but mm. it's a bit too late because when you talk to Saudi women, uh, even those who are really professionals and uh, sportswomen since a long time, they tell you that they're not even qualified. Uh, I was in Saudi Arabia a few weeks ago, and I met a lady. She's the founder of Jeddah United, uh, co-founder, and she's the director, and she's also the captain of the women's uh, um, team. This is what she said, Nina Al-Ma'ina. Not even close. At this point, we are trying to make it on a national level integrated, help integrate it in, in public schools, and then compete maybe on a regional level in the Gulf, GCC, Arab countries before you think of Olympics. Because at the end of the day, you know, in the Beijing Olympics, Qatar and Brunei never qualified. And that was the reason why they never made it to the Olympics. It's not because they didn't allow the women to compete. They just weren't at the level of competing in, in Olympic uh, levels. So we will need a long time. It's quite a courageous decision by the kingdom, but it's a bit too late. They have layers and really long way before they qualify, probably. So this seems to be more symbolic by uh, King Abdullah, uh, the reformer here, but it's a major reform, and it actually links in very carefully to this economy. He's building huge universities, female universities there in Riyadh, which is an extraordinary uh, huge investment. But the per capita income, for example, in Saudi Arabia trails the UAE, it trails Kuwait, even trails Bahrain right now. There's very high unemployment. There's a, there's a move here to try to get women into the workforce because of the lost income that we're seeing right now. There is high unemployment. It's 17% 7 per, uh, across Saudi Arabia. And if uh, the amount is 7% among men, it's 28 percent among women. This is the latest study by Booz Allen. Uh, but also it's quite significant to, to find that 55 percent, 55 to 57 percent of the uh, university graduates are women. Mm. So Saudi women are ready. This decision is quite symbolic, even if it's only on the sports level. It will reflect itself on all levels in Saudi Arabia, on the economy, and definitely it will get women more involved. However, women are battling now with the conservative views. Many people in Saudi Arabia think it's un-Islamic to work, un-Islamic to be in sports. Even some of these ladies I saw among the sports team, they had to veil just to prove that they are conservative, they are very mm. Islamic and traditional, but they can play sports and uh, compete internationally.